We know a lot of you are in the market for building a gaming PC right now, so we wanted to come up with a budget guide on how to build the best $500 gaming PC that you possibly can right now. We'll be having guides coming up for the higher price tiers, but we thought we should start with you budget conscious folk first. So be sure to smash that like button and get subscribed if you want to show your support for us doing more of these videos going forward. Also, each of the parts mentioned for the build can be picked up on Amazon using our Amazon affiliate link down in the description. It won't cost you a cent, but using it will help us out tremendously if you're going to be buying a gaming rig this holiday season or early next year. Building a gaming PC within a semi-rigid budget can be hard, and with all the options that came available this year, it can be even harder to decide which components make it into your new build. Luckily, it doesn't have to be, since I'm here to do it all for you. We'll be suggesting the best full system build minus any software, so you have to factor in the cost for Windows or otherwise if you plan to go that route. I'll actually be listing two different systems in this video. The primary focus will be the one based on the $500 budget, but as a bonus for my South African audience, which I'll officially be referring to as the Czar build, I'll also list parts based on a higher but equally worthwhile rig based on a budget of just under 9,000 Rand. First up for the build is the most important part of any new PC, the CPU. Until we decide which CPU gets the honor of becoming the heart of our rig, we can't do much else. But which CPU will offer us the most performance, or more importantly, the best value for our budget? The choice should have become obvious when I dropped the word value. Even with the release of Coffee Lake, where Intel stopped being, you know, Intel and gave consumers what they wanted, more cores and threads across all ranges, AMD's Ryzen still triumphantly wins the overall value crown. The Ryzen chips are just phenomenal things. Before Coffee Lake, they included more cores and threads than their Intel equivalents and didn't skimp too much on the clock speed either. Because of this, I feel that I had no other option for this build than the Ryzen 3 1200 for $109.77. Currently, the lowest end entry in the Ryzen lineup, the 1200, isn't nearly as exciting as the R5 and R7 siblings. However, sporting four cores and threads running at a base and boost clock of 3.1 and 3.4 GHz respectively, it's more than capable of running most newer games without a hitch. And since all Ryzen processors are unlocked for overclocking, it shouldn't have too much trouble reaching at least 3.9 GHz. The closest Intel equivalent currently on the market is the Core i3-8100 with a similar core and thread count, but its lack of overclocking capability and a $130 price tag and the fact that there's still no budget motherboards for coffee like took it off my consideration list real quick. Also, going Ryzen means you'll have a great path to upgrading in future years with AMD's dedication to support the AM4 socket until 2020. So if the Quad Core 1200 starts losing its luster in the next 18 months, you should still be able to swap it out for a new CPU, no problem. So South African buyers have fewer options when it comes to CPUs, but we're not losing too much out on performance or we're not paying too much extra for the CPUs. Luckily, this is one of the parts that isn't too insanely marked up. Thankfully, Wootware currently has a listing for the Ryzen 1200's bigger, badder brother, the 1300X, available for 2,099 RAM, which makes it the CPU we're going to go with for the Czar builds. After deciding on the CPU, the motherboard is the next logical step, because it's the logic board. Anyways, since we'll be using a Ryzen processor, we'll need an AM4 board. Which AM4 board you'll go with depends entirely on your needs, but I decided to go with MSI's Micro ATX Pro Series B350 at $60 after rebate. I chose a B350 motherboard because they can overclock, and at this price range, you're most likely not going to be needing the SLI or Crossfire support offered by X370 boards. I also chose it because it offers all of the usual I.O. connectors, has four DIMM slots, even though many micro ATX boards only have two, and it just seems to be a very well-rounded board. It also doesn't look like complete crap, which is a major plus. On the South African side, we have yet another small form factor motherboard, this time in the form of the Biostar B350 GTN. Other than only sporting two DIMM slots, the board is just as capable as the MSI board and it's currently going for 1,399 Rand, and so we're going to be slapping it in the Czar build. Now, remember how I said that GPU prices have gotten better over the past few months? Well, they totally have, but unfortunately, it looks like memory has also picked up the slack. Due to many factors that I won't get into right now because they make me sad, RAM prices have once again skyrocketed in the last couple of weeks, so much so that it takes up a sizable chunk of a budget. But hey, there's nothing any of us can do about it, so the only option is to suck it up. And suck it up I did as I chose two 4 gig sticks of Patriot RAM. They're not the fastest modules ever, only running at 2400 MHz, but they should be just enough to keep the memory speed dependent Ryzen 1200 happy. Now, are they worth $88.99? Probably not. But like I said earlier, suck it up. There's nothing we can do about it. In case you're wondering why I went with two 4 gig modules instead of one single 8 gig, I did it because two modules running in dual channel configuration is almost always faster than a single one, especially for Ryzen, and the motherboard has room for two more when you want to actually upgrade. But seeing as the motherboard I chose for the Czar build only has two DIMM slots, I had to opt for a single stick of 8 gigabytes of memory. Getting two 4 gigabyte sticks would lock the system into only having 8 gigabytes, where going with one 8 gigabyte stick now and then adding another later seems 
seems like the smarter move. Now it's time for arguably the most exciting part of any gaming build, the graphics card. As I mentioned a thousand times already, GPU prices have been back on the decline, but that doesn't mean they still don't cost a heck of a lot. Trying to find a GPU that offers dang decent performance without tanking the entire budget was a tricky task, but it's a task NVIDIA's GTX 1050 Ti is more than suited for. One of the card's major selling points is 1080p at 60 FPS, and as long as you're reasonable with your graphics settings, that's an easily attainable goal. While not the most ideal graphics card for 1080p 60fps gameplay, that honor belongs to either the GTX 1066GB or AMD's RX 580, the ASUS GeForce Dual GTX 1050 Ti costs over $100 less at $160. It really saddens me to have to do this, but I can't stretch the Tsar build's budget far enough to recommend anything much higher than Palette's GTX 1050. Even at 1,949 Rand, it took a massive swing at the overall budget. But fortunately, the benefit of both of these GPUs brings us to the next item on our list the power supply. Picking a power supply is often a game of figuring out how much power you'll need, then buying whichever one delivers that at the lowest cost. But cheapening out too much on power supplies isn't the smartest move. With that in mind, and after some quick calculations determining I need at least a 300 watt power supply, I opted for EVGA's N1 400 watt unit. Sure, it's not modular or all that efficient really, but it has more than enough to power the system and have a lot left over. It's produced by a really well-respected brand and it's only $30. For the Tsar build power supply, Corsair's VS350 should do the trick. Now there's just one more thing that we need to get the system up and running and that's storage. While opting for a traditional hard drive is definitely the cheaper option and will sport more storage space, the importance of an SSD can't be overstated. The switch from a mechanical to solid state drive is probably the single most impactful upgrade to almost any system you could possibly make. And even though the difference in gaming performance won't be as pronounced as literally everywhere else, there are games that load a heck of a lot faster when installed on an SSD. The budget, however, doesn't allow for an SSD with anything more than 120 gigabytes of capacity. That should be enough to hold you over until you're able to add in a mechanical hard drive for cold storage later on. The cheapest SSD that I could find that looked like a winner was Silicon Power's 120 gig SSD, currently selling at a painfully high price of $45. On the South African side, we stick with the same capacity, only with a different manufacturer and we opt for a 128 gig Plexter SSD priced at 887 Rand. Now we're probably going to need something to put all of those components into. And I found just the thing, cardboard box. Yes, cardboard box. See, while compiling this list of budgety goodness, I completely forgot to include space for a chassis. With cardboard box as our option, I frankly tried to shave off a few dollars here and there to see if I could free up some budget for something other than a, just a cardboard box. But reducing the budget for other components would have forced me to choose either a subpar CPU or GPU for this build and would have resulted in a system I wouldn't feel all too comfortable recommending. Instead of that, I'm going to loosen the budget a little to include Thermaltake's Versa H15 Mini ATX Tower. The Versa H15 is by no means a flashy case, it does exactly what it needs to and not a whole lot more. It's also fairly compact, making it ideal for almost any desk size. There are slightly cheaper alternatives out there, but few of those are what I'd consider worth getting if you're going overboard with your budget anyways. And then on the ZA side, while not as objectively pretty as the thermal take case, the Zar build should fit quite snugly into Cooler Master's Masterbox Lite 3, currently going for 506 Rand. That brings the total for the Zar build to 8,885 Rand, which is a little higher than I'd have liked, but going any lower would have severely compromised the the system's performance, and I ain't about that life, fam. So neither systems are exactly ideal for 1080p gaming, but they come really close. They should serve as excellent first gaming PCs or even an impressive upgrade to anyone still rocking budget parts from a few years ago. The US build of $527 gets you a decent quad-core Ryzen processor with a fantastic price to performance 1050 Ti. Running many games at low to medium settings at 1080p should be a breeze for this system and it'll absolutely destroy at esports titles like Overwatch, League of Legends, and hopefully give you some playable frame rates at PUBG. The thing that I would recommend you upgrade as soon as possible would be grabbing a large capacity hard drive so you can store all of the games. That 120 gig SD SSD is going to run out of space real quick, especially with the gargantuan file sizes game makers have been introducing this year. Many factors made it really hard to build rigs within these price ranges this year, but even so, it wasn't impossible. If you're smart with your picks and can resist going higher than your budget really allows, you can still build a dang good budget gaming PC. The Tsar build is the difficult one for me. For 9,000 Rand, you're getting a better CPU, but definitely not as appealing GPU. I know it's not always possible, especially at this lower price point, but I'd highly advise saving up that extra 700 Rand to buy something like this Galax 1050 Ti. It'll net you much better frames and have a bit more longevity than the Palette 1050. Should a 1050 Ti cost the equivalent of $65 more than the 1050? 
No, but that's the unfortunate reality of getting PC parts here in South Africa. And again, the same advice stands here, that I'd also drop in at least a one terabyte hard drive for that Steam folder storage so you're not left with only one install of Doom on your PC. It may have been a wild year for PC components, but no one can argue that we got some of the best parts with these launches. Whether you're on a small tight budget or had the money to go all out, 2017 was an amazing year for the PC master race. And again, be sure to smash that like button if you enjoyed this budget build recommendations video, subscribe to stay up to date on the upcoming higher end builds and all of our tech related content. And our Amazon affiliate code is down in the description if you wanna help support us here at the channel. Also, if you wanna talk about the build, either do that down in the comments or over on Twitter, I am at UF Disciple. Anyways, I'm Brett with the UFD Tech channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers. Slap it. Slap it. I have that motherboard. I have that motherboard. See, I have the motherboard. So we're going to slap it. There we go. Thanks, Wootware.